All right. Hello, Fortinas, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is March 17th, 2022. It's been a little while since the last one. Five days have passed. By the time this is all up and posted, it'll probably be six days. And uh, there are a couple of reasons for that, in which I'll get into. Um, but guys, we are in for an exciting one today. I have no idea what the title of this one's going to be. It's going to definitely be a continuation to the deep diving of the last one. And uh, <laughs> like our brother Roy said to me the other day, you know, it's a lot of this going on lately. There is there is revelation upon revelation and deep diving taking place that we're not spending too much time rehashing other bits and pieces. And so anybody that's new to this ministry, either here for the first time or, or um, you know, very relatively new, and you haven't yet come to this playlist right here, you need to come listen to this playlist. This, you don't necessarily have to watch the whole playlist, but if you start with these three videos, the, the, the biggest blessing in revelation of scripture you will ever get will begin right here from this video. Intro to the End Time Gospels Revealed, which we actually call Who the Gospels Are Speaking To. Some of these have printouts in them. You can come to the description box down below and click the link to do these printouts. You can go to our website, ministryrevealed.com, and download uh, the book, a free book on PDF, or you can buy the hard copy from Amazon and make notes and, and study and seek this out. But just start with this one video right here of who the Gospels are speaking to. It's the introduction to the revelation of the Gospels. It is the most important piece in all the scripture understanding, okay? Outside, of course, of salvation and so forth. But to, to understand the revelation of the Gospels, to understand the revelation in the is to come and the groups and who is being spoken to when, it reveals to you such incredible things. You'll understand that Luke is speaking to the bride of Christ. Mark is speaking to the sleeping church, right? The house of Israel. And Matthew is speaking to the Jews. And it will begin to blow your mind. And all of these questions that you've had over your, over your lifetime of, of, of being in the word and being in Christ, that, that these things that looked like contradictions in the scriptures within the gospels will be answered. Yes, they will be answered. But one thing you're also going to come to find out is as an end time ministry that's being revealed the open books as you begin to understand these things within the gospels you're going to realize that the tribulation isn't one set of seven years but two sets of seven years and that is very important now it doesn't mean anybody has to freak out it should be rejoicing because that means there there's seven more years sooner then if it was only seven years, you get it? Because if Christ returns feet down after 2,000 years and you only minus seven years, then you would still have several more years to go. You see? So it's more exciting. And the good news is, is you come to find out that pre, mid, and post-tribulation are all true. And you'll find that down in the sixth video. Pre, mid, and post are all true. That's why everybody can debate with scripture pieces that show pre-trib others that show mid-trib and others that show post-trib all right this is why it's so important luke's broad the bride of the the bride the bride of christ goes before the 14 years begins the great multitude rapture the great harvest portion goes in the seventh year of seals and at the 14th year the Lord returns feet down on the Mount of Olives at the seventh year of trumpets. Okay, you will begin to understand all these things and all of these, so many of the mysteries that you have had will begin to be answered so beautifully that you're going to, you're, you're going to freak out. We have all freaked out in this ministry and we still continue to freak out. And what you come to do next is as these things really pique your curiosity and you're really starting to understand them, come to the third video. It's a long one but it's beautiful you're going to understand how all of this was missed and that the reason is just like the title of the video it's all because of matthew all of our lives we've been told from the gospel of matthew 
We've always looked to the Gospel of Matthew and used Mark and, and Luke as the synoptic Gospels just to add a little bit more perspective. But it never rectified the differences. And so things got mashed up together like mashed potatoes and said, here's a potato. I mean, it, no, it's not. There's onions in there and there's bacon and there's sour cream and butter and salt and pepper. And it's all mashed together and saying, here it is. Well, no, no, I asked for a potato. You know, just, uh, just one big potato. They've mashed it all together. And as good as it looks and as good as it tastes, it's not what was to be understood. There are three different groups. There are three different groups being spoken to. And it's pre, mid, and post. And this video right here will give you the understanding of how Matthew has caused all of this confusion. Not because the church was aware of it, because they weren't. The answer is it simply wasn't the time yet. It wasn't the time for God to reveal these things. But in these last few years, as the end is about to begin, it was time. And for some reason, this is the ministry that's been chosen to, to receive it and to begin to open these things up to anybody that will just simply take the time and seek his word. Because all we do is teach from scripture, video after video, going into the deep, deep details of who is being spoken to when. All right. And that's what we're going to be doing here again today. We're going to be going into some serious Serious, heavy stuff, brothers and sisters. Um, I, I told you um, before, uh, just as I was getting started, that the reason there's been such a delay, you know, by a, a, you know another day and a half, two days between normal video times is twofold. Um, oh, you know what? I'll start by saying for everybody that had been asking, my wife is good now. Uh, she hasn't had the operation. They said it was a, a, her, her appendix was ruptured, uh, but it never burst. And so they're just going to, you know, let things settle down in there for the next few weeks. And she's going to go for an appointment and maybe in uh, in a couple months uh, they may operate. We'll see how it goes. Um, but she starts work uh, part time again uh, next week. And then hopefully by April she'll be full time. So uh, that's some good news. And she's feeling better and eating fine. And, you know, in that sense, everything's great in the house. Um, but. With that uh, uh, explained for you guys, I know because many of you guys were asking, uh, the reason for the length in between videos for this one is twofold. One is because this really sucks. <laughs> for me, it's caused distress in my heart and in my thoughts a little bit because, um, as you guys know, most of you know, we don't own our house, we rent. And uh, we've been here for just about six years and the owner came and put it up for sale. So he's he's been a very nice owner. There's there's no issues with it. He's a Christian as well. Um, hopefully not sleeping church. You know, we try to let him know things, but um, he put the house up for sale. And that totally stinks <laughs> for, for a nice word. Um, he, he It looks like, you know, we have to get 90 days at most. Um, because, you know, I'd said it's a very important time, obviously, within the ministry. Uh, so I said I was hoping not to move until, you know, no earlier than July 1st. Um, but we'll see what happens with sales and so forth uh, of houses and the market being pretty hot. Um, so it's just caused uh, a little distress because, of course, it has me asking the Lord what the heck is going on, you know. Why? Why now? Why do we have to be taken away and be or, or be distracted from the ministry? going to look at places, um, you know, uh, the the expense of moving and, and deposits and uh, the packing and the garbage runs and doing all these things at this time. I know life happens and we still have to live until, right? So we still have to do what we have to do on our end here as well and and play everything out as if maybe we don't go. Not because I don't believe that, but we still have to live as if, right? And um, so it's just caused me a little bit of heartache uh, with, <laughs> in conversation with the Lord. And it's kind of had me down a little bit because in, in these final moments, as we're doing these final, this final push and, and 
digging deeper and spending this time with the Lord, I get pulled away with all of this now. So with that, I don't, I, I'm going to do my best not to be too long in between videos. Uh, but this one was just kind of a little bit sore on the heartstrings this time. So that was part of it. And the other piece of it, brothers and sisters, is today's video. Today's video, um, it, it's going to continue, as I said, with what we were talking about with some parts right here in, the, in going deep to blow your mind. Um, in the, the Moses times one, you know, the Moses leading into the Joshua. And that's what we're talking about. We're, 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 we're going to be talking about this, this maybe a little bit in the, in the beginning portion, but we're essentially what we're going to be doing is, is continuing this end of seals into trumpets portion, but we are going to start a little bit towards the beginning as well, right? Towards this, this escape and this, these confirmations. And then we're really going to go to this portion uh, towards the end of seals, start of trumpets, and then into trumpets with that portion we've been talking about Joshua. Um, because we've been we've been talking lately about how how the the um, the book uh, not the book but how Moses's story and Joshua's story how Moses's story is the story of seals and Joshua's story is the story of trumpets and we did the portion uh, in a, in a, in detail but not overly detailed with Moses. And I was expecting maybe to talk a little bit uh, on the last video, but when I saw it was three hours, I was like, no, 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 we got to end this now. So we're going to go into that today. But what had happened is as I was going through this, guys, even now I could feel my, I could feel the circuits in my mind dealing with all these things and, and, and trying to, to piece everything I was piecing together today and, and, and specifically tonight. Um, which is why it's such a late video, but now I cannot wait. I've been so flustered for, uh, you know, two, three days now. Uh, I cannot go to bed without getting this video done today. So what what had happened is, uh, as you guys are going to see, there's going to be some crazy new revelation, uh, new, new pieces of the puzzle coming forward, um, in particular when it comes to the end of seals, beginning of trumpets time. We've talked about parts of this before. Uh, many other parts we haven't talked about before, but when you see it merge together, you're going to say, oh my goodness. And, and I went in as I, I had all of these tabs open, you know, the tabs go from, uh, where are we? We're going to go from like right here. And there's like, I don't know, 25, 30 tabs or something like that. And we're going to go through some of these things or all of these things, but I, I had them mixed up and I had them a little bit jumbled. I was had some over here I was going to start with, and then I had other over here and I had more at this end. And it was kind of, you know, it was kind of mixed up. And I think that was causing me a bit of frustration with the, with the, the mood I'm in. And uh, it's caused a little bit more frustration. So I said, forget it. All right, let me start reorganizing this and, and speak it out and really, really plan this one. So this one I really had to plan. And once I started to really grasp it, I said, honey, I, I went in the house. I said, okay, I got it. I got to have my second cup of coffee now. And I said, I'm ready to go. And so, of course, as you guys know, I'll go in and I'll start talking stuff with my wife. And in this, I had never had a chance to talk to anybody about it yet because it never fully came to fruition until tonight. And like anything, it's going to continue to build just like the whole Moses and the, the whole what it represented. And and we've we've spoken about how how these things that played out over decades and hundreds and a you know, 2,500, 3,000 years in the Old Testament and, and these events that played out within stories of the New Testament, they're all going to be smushed down in time to play out over 14 years. So 120 years of the life of Moses is going to play out in the seven years of seals. Okay. And then all of Joshua's time is another example that will play out in the time of trumpets. And what all this was really leading to, as you guys are going to see, is there's there's some important pieces when it comes to the two olive trees. This became a big thing just in these past couple of days as I was digging into stuff, continuing from the last video. And, and I realized that there was something in relation to Messiah as king that wasn't quite jiving with my spirit. Now, not to say that Messiah isn't the, the lion of the king of Judah. Absolutely he is. But I'm talking about the timing of when he is that lion. 
and you're going to see what i'm talking about because we're going to see him at the beginning we're going to see both of him at the beginning but when i started to struggle with was was as it leads into this the two olive trees and the two olive branches and they're standing beside on on each side of the lord of the earth and and you're like wait a second but if this is that then what's the other one you'll see when we get to it and as we continue to build it and so this one was causing me a lot of distress and uh i went in and i was talking to my wife and and i'm explaining it to her and i'm breaking it down and i'm seeing these things now and as i'm explaining it to her like i don't know 20 minutes ago i get this sudden revelation boom and i get my tingles right the the goosebumps the chills that just run through my body i used to talk to you guys about that quite a bit in the past but now revelation comes and i don't always have to get them because i'm understanding but this was one of those and brothers and sisters it's about something that we're going to start right off with as we get going here which related to to uh, um not joseph but that related to judah and it was we're going this is this is how we're going to start it and this is how we're going to end it and it's to remind you of binding his fowl unto the vine and his ass's colt unto the choice vine this is something we've talked about in the last video we touched on it as well to say we know this this is matthew's portion well when we understand where it is in matthew's portion which is something we're going to build on as we as we bring this to an end you're going to see that we know and we've all known the differences within the gospels and that luke and mark don't have two animals just one so there's always been this mystery as to why when he returns is he is he going to have two animals wouldn't that mean that there's somebody else with them well what i'm going to share tonight i believe could possibly maybe be the revelation of the two witnesses as we have never seen it before the revelation of the two witnesses and why there is a fowl and a colt here in the definition of judah and why it was only found in matthew and where this really digs into for us is when we get into the book of zechariah we've spent a lot of time over these past few years in zechariah but we have spent very few within chapter three four five and six and that is where we are going to get some incredible revelation um tonight all right so let's get going sip on my nice hot coffee at 9 30 at night <laughs> coffee number two so um yeah so as as mentioned anybody that's new come and watch that playlist start to understand what's being revealed here come to the ministry revealed website you can check out our facebook account or twitter account you can support the ministry if you so if you're if you're feeling led to if you're if you're being fed and let's get going now i wanted to start by sharing our sister petra she started her youtube to her sorry her youtube channel finally um she's uh been following ministry revealed for a long time but she gets uh, incredible words from the lord and she just great great um uh, she has devotionals and so forth and i sent her a a, a comment the other day uh, maybe a week or so ago saying man you, you need to get these on youtube so more people can get to you and and hear what you're talking about and it was funny because she had said the lord had just led her to the same thing after all of this time and so she just started it a couple days ago so you can come see it right here the spirit of wisdom and revelation and it's our sister Petra from South Africa. All right. So remember when we when we when we spoke on this just recently. This was a find that uh, that Jared brought to our attention over in uh, the Ministry Revealed forum, and he noticed just in the descriptions of the names 
of Joshua and of Judah, we have the descriptions of Christ in two forms. And what we mean by that is we know that Yeshua, we know that there's this, you know, it says that the Jewish tradition of late or the early second temple period alludes to two redeemers, one suffering and the second fulfilling the traditional messianic role, namely Messiah ben Joseph, okay, which is Yosef, which is Joseph, and Messiah ben David. And so this is this is brought up and we, we've spoken about this, we revealed uh, uh, parts of this that were very important to understand. We, we have shown, we have understood that Messiah who came the first time, he told us, he told us that he came but for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So if he came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, then what about the house of Judah? What about the house of Judah? It just, you see, it doesn't, it, it doesn't make sense. That means there's, there's got to be something else going on with the house of Judah. And we've spoken about this many times. And it, it brings us back to the creation and the Luke group, and then the days group, which represents the world with Mark group, and then and then from Adam, which represents the Matthew group, God's people. Okay. We shared here how in Isaiah chapter 6, from verse 8 to 12, I guess we've got here, how it says that uh, you know, everybody hears about this, right? Then said I, here am I, send me. And he said, go and tell this people, hear ye indeed, but understand not. And see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat and make the, their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. This is this has always been fascinating. You're like, isn't this the reason Christ came? Was so that their hearts wouldn't be covered, so their eyes would be able to see. But he was sent and was told to make sure they can't see, so that the so that the Lord's plan would play out on purpose, right? Because why? Well, if the Jews came to understand right away, then there would have been no there would have been no uh, uh, um stumbling. There would have been there would have been no time for the Gentiles to be grafted in who represent the house of Israel because they've mixed in with the Gentiles around the world. So if, if the if the eyes of the Jews weren't weren't concealed, then they would have probably accepted the Lord when he came. You see, so they had to be hearts made fat and eyes heavy and ears plugged. And it had to wait until this this desolation came upon them. This is what we've been talking about what we've been sharing a lot and how we show that at um, Luke's transfiguration story, we see this exact same thing or the triumphal entry. So the triumphal entry, when you watch in the intro videos, you where we talk about pre, mid and post, this is one of those things we talk about. Remember, we said that in Luke's, you only see a cult. Okay, you don't see the same as in Matthew, you only see a cult. And this is a typology, when you understand who the Gospels are speaking to, this is a typology of Christ coming as the Son of Man to begin the 40 days. And look at what happens when he comes. The, exact, the, 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 the immediate conversation at his triumphal entry that follows is that they were blinded. That they did not know. See, and now they are hid from thine eyes. This is to the Jews. Okay, now they're going to be surrounded and they're going to be destroyed because they knew not the time of their visitation. And you say, oh my goodness, but, but they were blinded. And then we say, praise Lord, we don't understand your, your purpose in everything, right? Or the reasoning for everything. But thank you, Lord, because we have been grafted in because of it. All right, it's all part of his plan. So we've talked on this and we showed this here and we see that here it's only the cult. See, and it says, because the Lord hath need of them. So if they ask, 
you know, what are you taking the colt for? You say, because the Lord hath need. And all you see is the colt and conversation about the Lord. When, when we follow this along, uh, we'll, we'll get to it in a moment where we're going to go into the other ones where you see something similar in Mark's. But when you get to Matthew's, it's very different. And so as we've spoken on this, there was something very, very, <laughs> I'll say frustrating for me because be even now as I'm thinking about it, I, I, I'm trying to, to keep those synapses going in my mind where this is all going to explode in new revelation for you guys because, because we've been trying to understand this, this Joseph portion and this Messiah ben David, which is the house of Judah, okay? And we've been and we've been making these associations, and we know that this one is connected to this to to when Yeshua comes as the lion, when he comes as the lion, and he's what is he doing? When Messiah comes at the gathering of the people, biting the fowl and the ass, and what? Washing his garments in wine, the clothes, the blood of grapes. This isn't at the beginning of trumpets. This is at the end of trumpets, right? And you're going to see this in relation to this even more clearly as we progress, and especially as we get to the end of this, what this could all mean and who is related to this. Because one of the other pieces we came to understand is that the Joseph portion of the two messiahs, knowing now and understanding that there are two messiahs, we know that it's it's the same Messiah, right? Messiah Joseph, right? The line of Joseph, who was what? Who was the 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 from thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. Okay, he has his bow. Okay, the crown of his head. We, these are all things we spoke about in the previous video. This is all about Yeshua. Messiah who came the first time. But there's some very, very important information in this. And that is that Messiah Joseph is related to or known also as Mashiach ben Ephraim. Ben Ephraim. And we touched on this in the last video. Why is this important? Because Ephraim's name means double portion. Ephraim's name means double portion. So if Ephraim under Messiah ben Joseph means double portion, then wouldn't the second time during trumpets also be still as Ephraim? As the tribe of Ephraim? Which means there's still somebody else here regarding Messiah ben David. And this is really, really, this, this is for heavy hitters, guys. Be prepared for what we're talking about here. Be prepared to, to pause and to take your time. And it was probably a good idea that it was an extra few days for you guys to, to maybe focus and pay strong attention to the last video a little bit more because this gets really intense okay watch this when we go to revelation chapter 5 look at what happens here and this is uh mike brought this up mike and jamie were talking about this over at uh, interrupts 165 and he had asked me this question as they were looking at it and i don't have all the answers yet but you're going to see more pieces of this come to light here. In Revelation chapter 5, we know that uh, he says, who is worthy, right? Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? Let's go to Revelation chapter 5 in our beautiful eSword program that people can download for free or for a few bucks. No, it's not ours. It's uh, been around for a couple decades, I think. So here it is. It's a book that was written and on the backside sealed with seven seals. Okay, which means you cannot open the book 
until the seven seals are broken off. Okay? And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Revelation chapter 5, verse 2, with a loud voice saying, Who is worthy to open the book, comma, and loose the seals? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. So far, there's three things. You notice that? Opening the book, able to loose the seals or to break the seals thereof, or to even look at it. That's three things happening. Verse 4 says, And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. Okay? Here you go. You've got these, but you don't even have the seals there, right? And one of the elder said unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. Okay? Now, this is the lion of the tribe of Judah. So this is the lion who has the ability to open it and has the ability to loose the seven seals. And I beheld in low. So this is what's proclaimed by the elder. Okay? This is the elder who's proclaiming this. Weep not, behold the lion. So it's not what John is seeing. This is what the elder is telling him. And then John looks. And I beheld. So now John looks to see what he's talking about. And when he turns around to look in the midst of the throne, in the midst of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb. The elder said it was a lion, right? The elder said it was the lion. But when he turns around, he sees it's the lamb. He sees the lamb as it had it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes. Okay? Seven eyes, which are the spirit. Let me highlight this. And seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. This is going to be important in a little while, okay? The seven eyes, which are the seven eyes of the Lamb, sent forth as the spirits of God, the seven spirits sent forth into all the earth. Now listen to what happens. Now, the elder proclaimed it was the lion of the tribe of Judah, but John turns around and he sees it's the lamb as he had been slain. He has seven eyes, the seven spirits of the seven churches, uh, right, of the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book. He came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. Okay? Did he get to open the book? No. Nope. Did he look on the book? No. Nope. Did he read the book? No. Nope. He took the book. Verse 8. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials of orders, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book. Again, three times he's worthy to take the book. And then it says, comma, and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and has redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Sorry, one second. And kindred and nation and made us unto our God pre, uh, uh, and made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth and you go on you can read okay then you have your uh, uh, beheld and i beheld and heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders and the numbers of them and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands all right so what we see here is that it was the lamb who was able who was able to take the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne but he wasn't able to open the book 
neither was he able to read the book or look look upon the book he was able to take it and what open he was able to take it and open the seals thereof okay so let's see this word or this this connection time frame to the opening of the seals we know that right off the bat right here and i saw when the lamb had opened one of the seals which also means the first seal which opened one of the seals okay when opened the first seal what do we know the connection is to this time frame watch this here's the word opened it's the same g455 and look first of all this word could you imagine the word opened and the relating words to it there's not one time where it's used in mark i just thought that was interesting but where we can read it in luke in a couple of these places in particular the first one is very very important to us okay we know this right here if when he opens so the word opened is the g455 and when the lamb opens right breaks the seal or opens the first seal he's not opening the book the books cannot be opened until of course the seven seals are broken okay so now he opens the first one and what is the timing of the first one well we've been teaching it as the white horse rider as the son of man coming that is the first the timing of the first seal being broken so when the first one is opened we could say or we should say when is it luke chapter 1 verse 64 let's have a look at what luke chapter 1 verse 64 says what is the timing of it it should have a timing right for those places that we've understood the timing of the opening of the first seal should be connected somewhere that we understand and check this out it's the eighth day when john is to be circumcised which we have shown is the timing of the circuit of the sun this year which is the eighth day what ends up happening john's father on the eighth day and his mouth was opened there it is g455 and immediately and his tongue loosed and he spake and praised god why was this important for us this is the eighth day that we're talking about the escape the eighth day either the escape now let me correct that either the escape is going to happen on day one or it's going to happen on the eighth day the beginning of the circuit of the sun okay day one feast of weeks okay one two three four five six seven right after seven to the eighth day so it'll either be in here or it'll be in here we've talked about this many times and the reason I'm bringing it up is because where this word opened, which is connected to the opening of seals, it's the eighth day, which is precisely what we've been talking about from Luke chapter one. And it says, blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people. This is, this is exactly what we talk about. This is the beginning of the 40 days of the son of man. And I believe it's the escape, but it's possible in many of our conversations that the escape might be on day one that something might happen uh, on the feast of weeks and something else might happen well something else will happen after seven days to that eighth day which is clearly the beginning of the 40 days of the son of man it's just is the bride going at the beginning of the seven or after the seven which is that difference all right i personally have believed it's after but look at where else we find it so we've got one piece of evidence lining up with the opened which is at the beginning lined up to the first seal opening and we have luke chapter 12 verse 36. look at this luke chapter 12 verse 36 another one that is a hundred percent where we have been talking about it as well and you yourselves like unto men that wait for their lord when he will return from the wedding this is why we say it's possible the bride goes at the feast of weeks 
okay at the the moral after that that first day of the 50 day count and then it's se- after 7 days when the lord will return after the wedding and when he comes and knocketh they may open unto him immediately blessed are those servants whom the lord when he cometh shall find watching verily i say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come and serve them and then you see and if it be the second watch or third watch this is the 144 at the end of seals to start trumpets and this third watch is the end of trumpets for the millennial millennial rain workers this is the group we've been sharing on this for a few years as well two three years that this is the lord coming after the seven days that eighth day just as we showed right here the exact same time frame right here this is the beginning of the 40 days of the son of man and i absolutely believe with all of my heart which is why i've been so <laughs> so distraught with this with this getting ready to move into a new house when when we're everything's about to change what's the point <laughs> sorry you can see my rant or hear it anyways so and you know i i believe with all of my heart i can't not say thus saith the lord you will never hear me say it thus saith the lord unless he tells me himself without a visitation or or anything like that you're not going to hear me say it. this is revelation of seeking and discernment of scripture through the leading of the spirit that has revealed all these things to us not just today but these past almost five years four and a half or so so one of the things that you're hearing a lot of people as a side note you hear people still talking about calendars all the time i don't get it anymore i don't understand why this conversation with and and i don't mean within a year you know if something's a month off and blah 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 blah. that that, that, i'm not concerned about that this year everything's together right they had added an extra month this coming year to start everything off from last year and so it's it's in line so nobody should be saying one month off or anything like that but there's people trying to still discern which which calendar you know with all the hundreds of calendars and and all the the nations that have led over this over the millenniums trying to figure out which calendar is like pulling teeth it's worse than pulling teeth (laughs) because there have been so many but the lord made it easy for us guys the lord made it super easy for us why because everything prophetic that has been given to us is always saying 70 years zachariah jeremiah daniel psalms 70 years is everywhere but when 70 years of israel and when they came back into the land came and went it caused distress on every prophecy seeking person and studying person that's anywhere on the earth it caused a lot of distress but we were one of those ministries if not one of the only ones i know of anyways that has continued and continued and continued since the what we thought was 70 had passed we were one of the only ones the only one that i know of where we continued to look at it and continued to dig and continue to understand what is going on with 70. You see, the Lord made it easy for us. He knew we weren't going to be able to count thousands of years of counts and calendars and and all of those things. So what did he say? 70 years. He said, when you come into the land, (coughs) the key of Bible prophecy was when Israel came back into the land. See, when you shall come into the land. So if we can understand those scriptures, in relation to account when they come back into the land which is what we've now understood since last fall we understand that or even since two falls ago i guess now that it was three years and the fourth to the lord so last year when we were thinking it was after three we thought day one right because day one after three years is fulfilled day one begins the fourth year that's how it works but it's not it's going to mean the completed fourth year and 
when we realized that, we saw that it was three years plus one year. And then it says, in the fifth year, shall you eat the fruit thereof? Meaning the third year, you can't touch it. The fourth year is to the Lord. And from the fifth year forward is yours. Which means from the fifth year is the 70 years. So this year, Israel turns what? Israel, of course, turns 74 years old. Which means this is the time that it's going to be holy to praise the Lord. See, a celebration of thanksgiving for harvest and praise. We've shown this also, that this three plus one is found for us in Luke chapter 13. Behold, three years I am come seeking fruit on this tree, on, on this fig tree. And I found none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? Okay, and the vine dresser says, leave it alone one more year. Let me dung it about. And if it bear fruit, well, and if not, then after thou shalt cut it down. Three years plus one. So when you come into the land, three years plus one, then 70. And this was the mystery that hadn't been understood <coughs> or that had been missed by everyone if or most. So trying to go and do all these calendar counts, it's not necessary. Three plus one, 70. So if three plus one is four and then 70, that would be 74. That's May 14th of this year. They turn 70 years old. I'm sorry, 74 years old, but it was the three plus one to the Lord. And then this is what? The 70th is complete. The 70th year is complete this year in May. But this doesn't mean this is when we go. That's not what the Lord was saying. Because it's connected to his harvest time. It's connected to the Feast of Weeks. All right? So, guys, don't get too caught up in, in trying to, and I don't think many of you here do, but if you're listening or following others and, and they're talking about all these complications and saying this one to that one, it's not necessary. All we needed was them back in the land and then to understand these three plus ones. All right? So as we saw this, we see this, the Lord opened. We can see this period of time from uh, 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 Luke chapter 1, which is directly related to the time of the eighth day when the Lord comes to begin his 40 days. We saw the exact same thing here in this exact same period of time. This is when the Lord comes to begin his 40 days. And this group that is watching is the group from Luke chapter 24 we've taught on many times. So <clears throat> we see the body is gone. And this is one of the reasons I believe it's the, the escape happens. The soon as the escape happens after seven days, okay, in that time of the eighth day, the escape happens and the Lord's 40 days will begin. And this is one of the reasons where we see the body of the Lord Jesus was not found, okay? His bride. And then you see it's the two on the road to Emmaus, and these are the ones that he sits and he eats with and he serves and so forth. That's that group from Luke chapter 12. So again, this, this connection, and, and it's the lamb, and it's the opening of the first seal, it's directly connected to the timing we've understood. <coughs> but you see... There's something else going on when we now go to this portion of, of um, Judah. And what you're going to notice, and we'll, we'll wrap this, like I said earlier, we'll wrap this into the end as well. But one thing we notice is this fowl and this ass is cold. When we go to Matthew chapter 21 is where we see it. So an ass tied, and a colt with her. And if anybody asks what it's for, say, the Lord needeth it. And you go down to verse 5, uh, Matthew 21, verse 5. Tell ye, the daughter of Z uh, um, tell ye the daughter of Zion, behold, the king cometh unto thee, meek, sitting upon an ass, comma, and a colt, the fowl of an ass. So you got it said once, twice, three times, just in case people didn't get it. 
There's something going on here, guys. And when we spoke about the uh, the playlist and the playlist talking about pre, mid, and post, when you go to that video about pre, mid, and post, one of the things that we use in the pre, mid, and post is showing that the triumphal entry in Luke's story, as I showed in the beginning, that Luke's triumphal entry story is a typology of Christ coming as the Son of Man for 40 days. And he's going to be warning Judah. He's going to be warning Jerusalem. He's going to do as Jonah did. All right? And when you go into Mark's, it's the end of seals. It's when he comes at the end of seals, and it's the portion of that seventh year of seals. And we talk about how Matthew is when he comes in Matthew's triumphal entry is when he comes at the end of the sixth trumpet. When he's going to return feet down. Well, when he returns feet down, there's two animals here. But more than that, what do we also see? That he's now called the king. He's now called the king. And you got to say, well, wait a second. <laughs> because, because back in the definition of Judah, when he's the lion, it's talking about him with the two animals, right? Him coming with both. And it says that his garments are washed in wine and the blood of grapes. Well, this is, of course, the seventh year of trumpets. So it would appear <coughs> that his portion of coming as a lion isn't actually until the end of trumpets remember joseph you must remember this that joseph being that it's mashiach ben ephraim which is what we shared in jeremiah jeremiah chapter 31 which was part of the last video i think it was when this had always been such a mystery to us for i am a father to israel and ephraim is my firstborn this is yeshua messiah is the firstborn and he's being called ephraim well of course we understand now that he's ephraim that he's from the the tribe of ephraim because he's hosea right he's osi who gets his name changed to yeshua so joshua's name He's not somebody, some new character. He was actually Hosea. And he had his name changed to Yeshua. So if Hosea is from the tribe of Ephraim, then of course, Joshua is from the tribe of Ephraim. What does Ephraim mean? Double fruit, double portion. Which means... That Messiah ben Joseph, son of Joseph, who has a double portion, has a, has a portion in seals for seven years, and has a portion in trumpets for seven years. Well, then what about the, the line of Joseph? Okay? Because in Revelation 5, we see in heaven that he's there. And that his reference of him being here, when John turns around, he sees him as a lamb. But the lamb isn't the one yet being able to open the book. See, he can simply open the seals. So the question, even with Mike, that he was asking is, I wonder when, when did this happen? If he is both the lion right, of the tribe of Judah, of the root of David, and if uh, uh, the line of Joseph, who is the portion of the lamb and as the shepherd, when did this happen? Well, that's part of a mystery, I guess, right? Because you can say it goes all the way back to the beginning, right? You could say when, when the tribe of Joseph and the tribe of Judah came about, that that, that is when the whole thing began. There was always going to be two. 
one but two you're gonna see guys this is gonna get really really wild really deep and really heavy in these connections but this one as messiah being the lion of the tribe of judah he has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seals but it's not him as the lion who does this yet it's the lamb okay it's the lamb the root of david this tribe of judah david who is the lion doesn't appear it would appear until the end but then what about these other things that we've taught what about this messiah ben david who is going to what who is what is this messiah ben david supposed to do all right watch this uh, da, 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 da. where is the messiah ben david listen to this Moshianism uh denotes of movement or system of beliefs and ideas centered on the expectation of the advent of a messiah orthodox views hold that the messiah will be descended from his father through the line of king david and will gather jews back into the land of israel okay this we know is the end of seals okay but not jews will gather israelites back into the land okay remember there it's almost like there's two things happening here and it's going to blow your mind as you begin to see it so they would say to gather the jews back into the land but we know from jeremiah 31 that when they're gathered back into the land at passover at the time of the rapture it's the 10 tribes rachel's children are not there it says she weeps because her children aren't there and god says don't worry their time is coming your reward your reward will be will be remembered and they will come back into the land so you see there's still something going on for the jews but it says and i he will gather the jews back into the land of israel and you see when the world uses the word jews a lot of times they use jews to also mean israel and and it gets all confusing so he is going to gather israel back into the land before the actual quote unquote Jews are gathered back into the land. <clears throat> but listen to this. Ushering in an era of peace. We know that that's what he's going to do. He's going to make a covenant with the nations. And what? Build the third temple. Now we've spoken about this quite a bit. That this building of the temple is, is so crystal clear to us now. That. We, we've been showing it like the back of our hand, right? Zechariah, 14 chapters. The eighth chapter is the beginning of trumpets. And here's the Lord returned unto Zion. And look what happens. The foundation of the house is laid that they might now build the temple. And they couldn't build it before because tribulation of seals was going on and they've been scattered. And now they're going to be all brought back into the land, the house of Israel, right? The ten tribes, the rapture time. And this whole rebuilding is going to take place when we've spoken about this we know that it's directly related to this his time of peace he's going to make a covenant with all the nations with most nations all right we've talked about this this is going to be with the the seventh seal is when he's going to make this covenant with the nations and then he's going to have to break it when satan is loosed Right? Because then he's going to be cut off. We're going to get into that today. Because then he's going to be cut off. And then he returns as this lion of the tribe of Judah when he comes feet down, which is why it's grape crushing and the blood on his garment of grapes because he destroyed all the enemies that came right when the pit was opened and everything else. But it's believed that this one through the line of david okay the king of david once they're gathered back into the land this era of peace and the third temple we know that this is going to come 
However, when we've associated this all the time, we've associated it with Christ only. With Christ only. But is it? You see? If Yeshua, who was Messiah ben Joseph from the tribe of Ephraim, right? Which was Messiah ben Ephraim, my firstborn, and he's called double portion. What do we know about Mr. Double Portion? Watch this. We know in, Re in uh, Numbers chapter 13, we see that the tribe of Ephraim was Osi, the son of Nun. Who is Osi? Hosea, the deliverer. Who's Hosea? We all know Hosea down here, right? Here's Hosea, 14 chapters written to the Gentiles, right? When we go to when we go to Romans chapter nine, we come to the story and we read about the Gentiles. See, not to the Jew only, but to the Gentiles, as he saith in Osi, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not my beloved. Okay, Osi, Hosea, and when we see this here, he's the tribe of Ephraim. Then this is a representation of the end of seals. At the end of seals, what happens? Moses changes Osi's name, Hosea's name, from Osi to the son of Nun, Yeshua. His name, Yeshua, is, of course, Joshua. But he literally calls them here Yehushua. This is the Lord. This is the Savior. And he calls him Yeshua. So this is why we've been building on this. And we know that the Moses story is seals and the, the Joshua story is trumpets. But it's going to get even more crystal clear for you. Because there's many portions of Zechariah that we hadn't gone into in a long, long time. And never have we gone into like this. Let me show you something that happened a couple days ago as I was starting to look into this. Just a little side note for you guys. Um, I'll keep uh, like hockey on in the background and not always. I mean, I don't follow it, but um, the, uh, uh, um, who is it? Uh, Washington Capitals, Ovechkin. It was an exciting night. Uh, I'd walked into the room from being outside in the, in the garage doing my studies and I go in and Ovechkin had scored uh, his... 767th goal it was uh to put him in third place overall in all goals scored in nhl in history third most ever and i had left i thought oh that's fun you know i like ovechkin in his, as a player just he's exciting to watch and um i come in later and they're talking about tj oc so i thought whoa here i am talking about oc right jose and this connection and we know that Osi or Osi, Osi, Oshia or Osi has his name changed to Yeshua because Osi's time is the first seven years of seals. And Yeshua, Joshua, represents the second seven years of trumpets. So you have seven that represent Osi and you have seven that represent Joshua or Yeshua. So they're in, we know they're the same person. So the same person, O.C., seven and seven, okay, from the tribe of Ephraim. They're the same person. Well, I thought it was interesting because when I saw his name, I had heard it before, but it never dawned on me. This player's name is O.C., and his number is 77. How about that? That's pretty cool, right? Just a little, one of those little God moments like he's just like, Hey, listen to this. <laughs> and his name, I looked it up. He's uh, he, he has Native American blood. I don't know if it's his whole blood or his whole mother and father, but definitely on his dad's side. And his name actually means coming home. <laughs> his name means what? Coming home, seven and seven, O.C., seven, Yeshua, seven, the same person, 7-7, seven, seven, and Romans 
chapter 9 said that the beginning of Osi or Hosea is when he said, go get your wife of whoredoms and children of whoredoms. Because why? We're coming home. <laughs> I just thought that was cool. Come on. What are the chances of something like that happening while I'm doing this, right? So very fun. And so let's continue here. As I had said, when we when we look at this in in Matthew and we're seeing this, we're seeing that this connection to the king, we're seeing the colt and the ass, that this is relating to the Lord coming at the end of the sixth year of trumpets, when the Lord is returning feet down. Which means something has happened before that we know that he was cut off and we know that he's returning again because there he was at the beginning of seals. Okay, sorry, uh, uh, well, at the start of seals and then there he is, he comes, they're coming on Mount Zion, he's coming in the clouds and he's there to begin trumpets. One portion of seals was as Hosea. The other one is as Joshua, as Yeshua. But as Yeshua, we know that he's going to get cut off. And for some reason, when he comes back, he's got two animals that he's coming in on. When we go to Mark's gospel, look at what we see. <coughs> Say that it's to the Lord. And what do we get? It's only a cult. So again, only a cult. It's for the Lord. Nothing about king. When we went to Luke's, same thing as we just showed a moment ago. A colt to the Lord, nothing about king. And then, of course, we see him drawing near to Jerusalem because this is him coming as the 40 days as the Son of Man. The one in Mark's is his triumphal entry as the typology of him coming at the end of seals to begin trumpets. Matthew's is his typology of him coming at the end of the sixth year of, seal, of trumpets to destroy all those that came against Jerusalem, right? All, destroy all those from the pit that it opened, and his garments are covered in the blood of grapes. Hence, like Judah, as the lion, when he comes with an ass and a colt, and he's covered with the blood on his garment. You see? It relates to the end. So again, if this relates to the end, you guys are going to freak out when you see where this is going. If this relates to the end, let's, let's draw more out of this to see that it relates to the end. Well, here's the reference from Matthew chapter 24, uh, Matthew chapter 21. So let's go to Zechariah chapter 9. Another one of those chapters we haven't, we haven't gone into too much. And what do we see? Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh. He's not come yet. He's coming. Cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the fowl of an ass. You see that? Listen what it says. Verse 14, and the Lord shall be seen over them, and his arrow shall go forth as the lightning, and the Lord God shall blow the trumpet, and shall go with whirlwinds to the south. What is all this saying? This is when he's coming, feet down on the Mount of Olives, as lightning from one end unto the other. This is saying when he's coming. Do you realize this isn't at the beginning? <clears throat> it's so much not at the beginning that it hasn't even happened yet. How many times have we been saying that lately and showing with Scripture that so many of the events described in Matthew are prophetic in relation to the events coming to, to pass in the time of, tr of uh, trumpets? That's why so many of these things don't make sense. How on earth can he be coming on an ass and on a colt? And he took, they, they went and got two of them, but in Mark and in Luke, it was only one. These are not things, you see, when we've spoken about these things in the past, and as, as we reveal 
the the meaning of the differences in the gospels that all these contradictions can be brought to light in the revelation of the end of days that that the church as we showed a few videos ago that the that the seminaries around the world they would teach that oh it's just different perspectives it's impossible that something like this is simply a different perspective because in mark and in luke it was one animal i don't care what perspective you're looking from it is a single animal your perspective doesn't change when you see two if you're all standing in a circle looking from three different angles you're not going to suddenly see two where the other two guys only saw one this hasn't happened yet this is what we were leading to in the last video he hasn't yet played out the lion of the tribe of judah it hasn't yet taken place we see him there in revelation 5 but he hasn't played out his turn yet he's there but when john turned so he i should say he john was told he was there but when john turned to look it wasn't him as the lion it was the lamb did you catch that that's not what john saw john saw the lamb so the opening of the of the seal still had to take place and the lamb doesn't have the authority if you will or didn't have the ability to read the book or to open it his was to take the book and to break the seals or to open the seals we've taught here look at zechariah chapter 9. zechariah one of those open books look at where it is zechariah chapter 9 is the second year into trumpets and it's saying that this is going to come this is going to come so when we see it over in matthew we can understand and say okay well this clearly hasn't happened yet when we see it in the description of judah's name in in revelation in genesis 49 we can see it hasn't happened yet so now this brings about this question that i keep alluding to which is if it hasn't happened yet but yet messiah the the son of man messiah jesus is going to be here as the son of man in, in, the, 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 at the end of seals to begin trumpets who is he he's not <clears throat> he's not judah lion yet he's the second portion of ephraim are you guys following that he's the second portion of ephraim he is going to be joshua the typology that remember types and shadows built into all of these all of the scriptures from revelation to from genesis to revelation he becomes the typology of joshua or yeshua is who he is you're going to see how crystal clear he is who he is but then it's going to beg the question who's the one building the third temple because it's believed and it's understood that it's somebody from the line of david somebody from the line of david is going to be the one presiding over the building of the third temple while yeshua or messiah ben ephraim as joshua is also here now you say well what am i getting at why why does he have to still be as messiah ben joseph well because it's ephraim and he gets a double portion seven of seals and seven of trumpets hosea yeshua the same person seven and seven so he's over both do you guys realize what uh, uh, what Joshua is or who Joshua was? Joshua, brothers and sisters, is the high priest. 
Yeshua, Joshua, is the high priest. Are you following? He is the high priest. Well, wait a second, then. Who's ruling over Jerusalem while the temple is being built? What the heck is going on? There has to be somebody of the line of David who is overseeing the building of the third temple who isn't the high priest. The high priest, brothers and sisters, is not going to be the one building the temple. Watch this. Zechariah chapter 6. Watch this, watch this. Uh, starting in verse Zechariah 6, verse 11. So this is towards the end of seals, right? The end of the sixth year of seals. Take Then take the silver and gold and make crowns and set them upon the head of Yeshua. Okay, Joshua, Yeshua. Behold, uh, uh, where am I? The head of Yeshua, uh, the head of Joshua, the son of Jostek, the high priest. Joshua is the high priest. He is not the one, the leader in the rebuilding in Jerusalem. And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch. Did you hear that? The man, the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of this place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Wait a second. You're going to see Joshua is Yeshua, guys. So if Joshua is Yeshua, then who's the branch that's going to rebuild the temple? We've talked about him many times. It just never dawned on us that, that he was finishing the job. Listen to this. You guys are going to be blown away. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule upon his throne and he shall be a priest upon his throne and the council of peace shall be between them both what on earth the council of peace is going to be between two of them during the time of trumpets, right? At the end of seals to the start of trumpets. It never dawned on me because I hadn't spent too much time in, in three through six of Zechariah. But we know who the we know who it is already. We've shared it many times. We know who the one is. In fact, we have shared Zechariah four. We haven't shared three, five, and six very often, but we've shared four a number of times. Who is four? Listen to this. This starts to get really interesting. Zechariah 4, verse 3. And the two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl and one upon the left side thereof. Verse 4. So I answered and spake to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? And the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest thou not? what these be and i said no my lord See, <laughs> i talk about this with my wife and i i always say what why does the angel respond with that he just finished saying i don't know what they are please help me understand what these two olive trees here are on each side of the bowl can you please help me understand and he's like don't you know who they are no that's why i'm asking you <laughs> listen to what he says my friends listen to what he says it never dawned on me before and as we get into further deeper study you're going to see what i believe or who the two witnesses are listen to this remember this conversation is about the two olive trees okay the two olive trees to the two branches 
And he says, no, I don't know who these two olive branches, these olive trees are. What is this relating to? And listen to what the angel says. Verse 6. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Who art thou, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? Thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace, unto it. Verse 9. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation. Remember? Remember how much we've taught about this? It's, the, it's Zerubbabel who is the one who lays the foundation of the house of the Lord during seals. We've talked about it. The fourth year of seals, that the foundation has been laid by Zerubbabel. Okay? This is going to happen during the seven years that they're removed from the land. The foundation is going to be built by Zerubbabel. I'm not going to tell you who I believe this is. I've told you before who I think it is. I am not going to say it in this video because when you hear what else I'm about to say of who this guy is in relation to Zerubbabel, you're going to say there's no way. And I don't want to hear it because I'm not saying with certainty that it is. I'm just saying listen to who Zerubbabel is, brothers and sisters. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also finish it. Hello. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice. See, they shall rejoice. And they shall see the plummet, okay, like the mortar, in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. Remember I told you, remember that? They are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro through the whole earth. Remember? Remember the seven, the eyes of the Lord? The seven eyes of the Lamb, right? Which are the seven eyes of the Lord that go out throughout the whole earth? And it says, and, and what are these seven? Well, if they're the seven and relate to the churches, who are the ones blowing the trumpets? You've got the seven angels blowing the trumpets, right? So they are the eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro through the whole earth. Then answered I and said unto him, what are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? And I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches? How many olive branches? Two olive branches from the two olive trees. Two olive branches from the two olive trees. Two branches. Which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves and he answered and said unto me <laughs> here it is again verse 13 and he answered and said unto me knowest thou not what these be you must be thinking he's got to say no i don't know <laughs> that's why i'm asking <laughs> and the angel says these are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. How many anointed ones? Two. What are they? Two branches of the two olive trees. Who are the two olive trees in the end of days? Because Zechariah's book is prophecy, right? Who are the two olive trees in the end of days? Oh, we're going to get to it. You guys already know who they are, right? Or you know what they represent. Well, from these two olive trees, look, there's two branches. And who are they? They are two anointed ones. What did we just read in Zechariah chapter 6 about branches? We see that Joshua, Yeshua, 
who is the high priest is being told that himself and one who is a man whose name is the branch is going to be the one who's going to build the temple and it's between the two of them so who are the two anointed ones who are the two branches that are the anointed with the oil one is yeshua joshua the high priest and the other is the man whose name is the branch he is the one who is going to build the temple who is the one who is of the two olive trees and of the two one of the two branches and one of the two of the anointed besides yeshua joshua zerubbabel zerubbabel is the one who is going to lay this foundation be the overseer in charge taking play taking part in laying this foundation during the time of about mid seals and he's also going to be the one to finish it what he's also going to be the one to finish it do you guys know <clears throat> that Zerubbabel was the governor of Judah watch this remember it didn't say he was going to be fully the king right but that he was going to be the ruler Zerubbabel as a typology to the end governor of Judea under whom the rebuilding of the Jewish temple took place and we know that we're seeing it in prophetic end time eyes okay whom the rebuilding of the Jewish temple took place in at jerusalem listen to this of davidic origin who is he the line of brothers and sisters he is of the tribe of judah of the davidic origin so he's from the tribe of judah of the line of david what are they looking for they're looking for somebody from the line of david which would be of course from the tribe of judah who is going to be the one to build, usher in the third temple in an era of peace. And I just showed you, scripture tells us, there aren't one of them over this, there are two of them over this. One of them must be Yeshua ben Ephraim's side, Messiah ben Ephraim, the double portion, which means the other one must be from the Judah line, from the lineage, the line of King David, who will also take part in bringing about this peace and be responsible in building the third temple. <clears throat> Are you guys listening? Not only is there a Messiah that came first as Joseph, not only is the messiah going to return again as lion and king at the end with the two animals but at the time at the end of seals to the beginning of trumpets when messiah will be here again as ephraim in the second portion this time as joshua he will be the high priest and it will be the modern day Zerubbabel from the line of David, who will be involved in this peace with Messiah and will be the one over, presiding over, helping and build with the plummet in his hands, the third flipping temple. Did you hear what I said? This is next level stuff. This is why I was short-circuiting all day and frustrated. Because this gets serious. That means there's two there at that time. And you're going to see when we get to this article, why I was short-circuiting. Because this article talks about 
a, a, a two Messiah. But we've already understood the two Messiahs. Both being Messiah, one, one Joseph, one David, as one, one the shepherd and the lamb, one being the lion at the end. But we didn't what we didn't understand was where this Judah lion at the end was. Now we know he's at, actually at the end. He's actually at the end. And so if he's at the end, then you're like, well, whoa, 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 whoa. who's who's gonna be responsible at trumpets? Messiah is not gonna be Messiah is not gonna be building the temple. <coughs> he's not gonna be involved in building the temple. He's high priest. Zerubbabel is going to be the one. Zerubbabel, we're told, is going to be a priest. Right? Go back to four. The one who's going to be the branch. This isn't Messiah. This is Zerubbabel. It's, it's Yeshua, Joshua, who's the high priest. And it's, jo it's a, a, a Zerubbabel. The one building who's going to oversee and help build the temple, who is also a priest, but not a high priest. Who do you think has more importance? The priest or the high priest? The governor, the one sitting on the throne at that time, or the high priest? It's always the high priest, brothers and sisters. And I'm going to show you in this study that I was reading about, <coughs> but when I went in and I was talking about it with my wife, she says, it's always the high priest. And it never dawned on me. I said, you know, would it be the king or the one ruling or would it be the high priest? And they said, no. my wife was saying, no, they would always go to the high priest. He's the one that's got the direct connection to the father. Of course, because it's Yeshua Messiah. He's the high priest. And what you're going to see that, that starts to make sense is when we go to Revelation 14, listen to this. And now you're going to say, oh. Here's the lamb stood on the Mount Zion and with him the 144,000 having the father's name written in their foreheads and as the voice of many waters and harps and singing a new song. Da, 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 da. And no man could learn that song, but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. Now listen to this verse four. These are they which were not defiled with women for they are virgins. Listen to this. This is the key that I want to share in relation to this point. These are they which follow the Lamb wheresoever he goes. Wasn't that ever a question for you guys? This for me was something, it didn't, wasn't something that bothered me, but it was always something in the background every time I would read it. Because you would think, well, what what's the lamb doing why why is the lord when he's here at the beginning of trumpets going around and and obviously making his way around because it says these are they which follow the lamb wheresoever he goes <clears throat> so it must mean that he's got to be going somewhere and we've also shared on this before remember the last chapter of romans first corinthians second corinthians that we've shared on and when you get to 1 Corinthians 16, it's it's the typology of the end of seals, right? The end of seals. And it's about who you wrote letters about. This is a typology of him coming. They're going to gather the rapture group, right? They're going to gather the saints. But there's a group that is going to help him and that is going to be with them and that are going to what? Take him on his journey. Okay? We've showed this typology. Um, and this is Paul. So it's a typology of Paul as a type of Christ. And it says, uh, and it may be that I will abide, yea, in winter with you, and that you may bring me on my journey wheresoever I go. You see, this, this one's a real wild one. Anybody that's new saying, what's he talking about last chapter, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians? I, I'm not going to explain it all now, but we've done many teachings on it. And we can see it's the end, it's the it's the time of the escape in the beginning of seals, it's the end of seals in the time of the rapture in the 144. And then 2 Corinthians is says it's the third time, and the Lord has come, and he's not bringing any destruction against Israel and unto the Jews, but now he's coming for them. All right. It's 
it's a taking a taking and a return it's the three times it's pre mid and post and it's in specifically it's to the worker groups that he's speaking to and so this is what's going on here we've taught on this probably probably over three years now something like that yeah probably like three and a half years where i have talked specifically that this is directly related to revelation chapter 14. and here we are in both cases shall bring me on my journey and follow me wheresoever i go and there it is you see wheresoever he goeth that these 144 are going to follow him so if he's going somewhere and he's out doing doing the 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 tours if you will and doing what he has to do during the time of the first half of trumpets then who's overseeing the rebuilding in jerusalem who's going to oversee all this rebuilding now we know it's zerubbabel and you know what's so interesting about this we've known it the whole time we've taught on this many many times about zerubbabel that zerubbabel is the one who lays the foundation and it's zerubbabel who's going to build it we've talked about the plummet in his hands okay watch this We're going to stick. This is an awesome storyline. So we're going to keep sticking to the storyline. Watch this. Let's go into Zechariah chapter three. Listen to this. He showed me Joshua, the high priest. Listen to what it says. Standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. Hello. Where do you think this is? It wasn't on the earth. It was a vision that he saw of Yeshua, the high priest, Jesus, the high priest in heaven and Satan standing beside him. He's trying to rebuke him, right? And you see he had filthy garments on and everything. He's going to be changed. His his work is coming. (coughs) Here's the conversation again. Let's start in verse 7, Zechariah 3, verse 7. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, if thou wilt walk in my ways, and if thou wilt keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house. Did you hear that? I was hoping I was going to remember this piece here. Thus saith the Lord. This is the Father. Thus saith the Lord God, the Father God. If you will keep my ways, I will give you charge that you shall also judge my house. Who have we been saying all this time is is the house of Judah? The fathers, okay? The, The spirit is over the bride. Christ came for the house of Israel. God's is the house of Judah. But Jesus is the one who is going to be the sacrifice. He is going to be that ox sacrifice. So he's, here's Joshua being told that if you will keep this charge then i will give you you can be the judge over my house and we know that that's going to also mean you know to be that sacrifice because the jews were blinded they need that sacrifice right <clears throat> here now o joshua the high priest thou and thy fellows that sit before thee for they are men wondered at for behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. There it is again, right? Joshua is the double portion. This branch, the servant, the branch is, is a, a, a Zerubbabel. Isn't that crazy? That's pretty wild stuff. Let's go to chapter five. Uh, was it five? No, let me see. Uh, four, three, four. Yeah, we went into four. So we know, <coughs> excuse me. So we know that the two olive trees and the two olive branches, one is Zerubbabel and the other one is Joshua. They are the two branches. They are the two anointed ones. You understand, guys? Do you know what's being said? It's saying that the two olive trees and the two branches, they're the two anointed ones. 
And who are the two olive trees? Who are the two olive branches? Who are who do they represent in the end of days? Well, one of them has to be the line of David. We've got it now. Who's going to be the one overseeing and the rebuilding of the temple? But Ephraim, who has a double portion, is also going to be there. So they're both going to be there. It's amazing. It's so awesome. All right, we talked about, um, oh, even from, oh, that's that's another piece we can get into. We'll save this for, for later. But we talked about this here now with Zerubbabel. So we see it says, uh, Zerubbabel is thought to have originally been a Babylonian Jew. Think of if America is Babylon, that this Jew who was born in Babylon, that will return to Jerusalem to rebuild. Okay? So a, 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 a high-ranking or a, a, a somebody who, who's been a builder, who's Jewish from Babylon, is the end-time typology of Zerubbabel, who is going to return to Jerusalem. Okay? At the head of the band of Jews exiled and the governor of Judea, under the Persians, influenced by the prophet Haggai, uh, Pagai and Zechariah, he rebuilt the temple and a descendant of the house of David. <coughs> now, watch this. This is that article I was telling you about. It's pretty wild. This guy wrote a book, and it was a book about one or two messiahs. And this really, really had me a little aggravated today. Because, as I said earlier, we know of this first Messiah coming as Josh, uh, 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 as Joseph's line, as the Ephraim jo Joseph line. And we know that there's another one when he comes as the line of the king of Judah, when he's going to have the wine on his uh, everything else, which means it can't be at the beginning. It must uh, at the beginning of trumpets. It must be him related to the end, which means what we were thinking, what we were believing that that this that when he comes at the end of seals to begin trumpets we we were considering that he was both that he was going to be high priest and he was going to be the role as the leader in jerusalem as as the overseer as the one rebuilding and the reason we were believing that is because there was two portions of messiah we know there are two messiahs and this is what i want you guys to grasp it's not only that there are Two messiahs of Joseph and of David, of, of Judah, Joseph and Judah. But it's that not only is there two that represent Christ, two that are Christ. And the Christians will tell you, the church will tell you that, yes, <clears throat> when he comes at the end of seven years of tribulation is when he's going to come as the lion. That's true, but it's not the seven years, right? It's at the end of the 14 years. It's, <clears throat> it's when he comes at the end of the seventh year of trumpets that he's going to come as the lion. So it's correct. But that's not what this is talking about. Hence the confusion and distress in my thoughts trying to piece it together. This one or two messiahs is not the same topic. <laughs> it's not the same topic. Because as you just saw, Messiah ben Joseph is Ephraim who has two portions, seven of seals and seven represented trumpets, Hosea and Joshua, Yeshua. It was, it was to, to Moses' time until that was done. And then it was Joshua who took him into the promised land. Yeshua took him into the promised land. Okay. Well, this guy wrote a book on one or two messiahs. And it's not the same one in the way we were looking at it. It's talking about really the time at the beginning of trumpets. And his book ended up getting uh, talked about on, on World News Report and ABC in 2020. Right? And Nightline. Listen to what he talks about. Watch this. Few, what few realize is that this expectation of a single Davidic Messiah had not so solid, not so solidified 
in the time of jesus in text and uh, sorry in text after text in a diverse variety of expectations reflected in a scattered range of primary texts from the period we read about any number of redemptive figures in terms of messiahs okay here we go in terms of messiahs we have found most commonly is not one but two messiahs who are to usher in the kingdom of god one is to be a kingly figure in the royal line of david but at his side will be a priestly figure also a messiah of the lineage of aaron of the tribe of levi the word messiah refers to one who is anointed or appointed in ancient israel both the kings and the priests were anointed with oil and thus called messiahs did you hear that the two who would be anointed were either kings or priests so you have joshua as the high priest and you have zerubbabel as the the priest or the leader type not quite king but as the leader at that point presiding over the rebuilding and sitting in at the in the throne there in jerusalem are you seeing where this is going are you seeing where i'm leading you not only the wowness of this beginning of trumpets that this story is the story about the beginning of trumpets and two messiahs being there at the same time and that these two messiahs being there at the same time are called the two anointed ones one is zerubbabel who will rebuild and one is messiah who is the high priest joshua yeshua there at the same time one going out in the 144 following him wherever he goes and the other one over rebuilding but it's not the same two messiahs that we talk about which is one relating to yeshua and the other uh, as joseph and the other one which is the lion from judah and the davidic line which messiah also is but that's not till he returns feet down this is a beginning of trumpets to messiahs where two have been anointed who are the two olive trees with the two branches they are the two anointed ones the only ones that could be anointed with the oil were either priest or king so who do you think the two witnesses might be hello <coughs> oh i'm not done yet so the verb messiah means to smear with oil mashiach right or moshiach or messiah in english is one so smeared or anointed as we say in english technically speaking the first messiah was aaron okay what do we know about aaron brothers and sisters aaron is the one responsible for the second strike aaron is directly the relation that we talk about when we get to john chapter 15 which is the final seven years which relate <laughs> i just saw the word <laughs> which relate to the time of the vine right which relate to this time with with aaron this time of trumpets and look at what it says every branch and the branch cannot abide and the branches <coughs> i didn't even remember that that was there how perfect is that <laughs> well, you guys know where that is for those that don't know see john chapter 15 it's the beginning of trumpets <laughs> right where the branches are talked about come on come on so okay we've we've spoken about this it's it's aaron who causes that second strike who causes messiah to 
to die again that we've talked about, right? To be sacrificed again, that that he's going to be the one, just like it said, Aaron, uh, sorry, not Aaron, uh, 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 Joshua, that you're going to be put, right? You're going to have charge over my house, over his people, over the Jews, because Messiah, we know, is going to be sacrificed as the ox. And it's because of the two strikes with Moses and Aaron. Jesus already fulfilled as Messiah the strike that Moses did. But the one for Aaron still has to take place. And that's going to be the one during the time of trumpets. And see, so technically speaking, the first one was Aaron. Yes. And Aaron is going to be the one responsible for the second strike that's coming. So, uh, brother of Moses, anointed with oil by his brother Moses, formerly made in the ceremony. The first anointed king was Saul, anointed by oil by Samuel, lost favor with God. And then David was the one also anointed by Saul. Listen to this. Okay. Um, both priest and king were accordingly messiahs or anointed, uh, which means the, the notion of two messiahs. Let's get to Zechariah. Zechariah in the 6th century BC Hebrew, uh, uh, Hebrew prophet foretold of a man called the branch who would bear the royal honor and sit on his throne. But he adds, there shall be a priest by his throne with peaceful understanding between the two of them. Here is a clear picture of the Davidic king and his counselor, the anointed priest. Zechariah refers in another vision to two sons of fresh oil. That's what we, saw, we were just reading, right? In Zechariah 4. Two anointed ones, or messiahs, who stand before the Lord of the whole earth. He likens them in his vision to the two olive branches. Hello. That stand before the menorah, the seven-branch oil lamp, symbolize the spirit of the presence of God in Zechariah 4. Now, listen to what it said. Okay, the two with oil, the Davidic line. And so we see the one sitting, right? This guy, whoever this Zerubbabel is, we're told in Zechariah, he's going to be the one sitting on the throne. Do you know why that's interesting? Because Christ doesn't get to sit in that position yet. He sits at the right side. He sits at the right side. Right? Sit thou at my right side. So Yeshua isn't until he, he comes at the end that everything becomes his. We've shown that at the even at the, the seventh trumpet. When, when that trumpet is blown at the seventh one, that is the big deal trumpet when everything comes to an end and the revelation of the Lord and of everything will be revealed at the seventh trumpet. Let's read a bit more. This ideal vision of two messiahs became a model for many Jewish groups that were oriented towards the apocalyptic thinking in the 2nd to 1st century BC. The testament of the 12 patriarchs dating back to the 2nd century BC puts things succinctly. For the Lord will raise up from Levi someone as high priest and from Judah someone as king that's exactly what we're talking about there from zachariah we know it's zerubbabel whoever modern day zerubbabel will be and it will be messiah the high priest joshua yeshua in his second portion uh throughout his influential throughout this influential work there is an emphasis that salvation for israel will come jointly from the tribe of levi and from the tribe of judah the tribe of king david the, the priest, Messiah, receives more attention than the king, Messiah. And in many ways, he stands superior to the Davidic figure. Just as my wife had confirmed without knowing any of this. Okay? Because it is the high priest who is closer to the father. He is the one in, in direct contact with the Lord God. He's the one <coughs> that was with him. And where did we see Joshua? In Zechariah 3, we saw him there in that vision. It was Joshua there standing before the Lord with the angel and Satan beside him. 
okay joshua is clearly messiah <clears throat> he is clearly the second portion for joshua which is why he's got the greater authority anyways over zerubbabel who is going to be the one there in the rebuilding and sitting there while messiah is out doing his work with the 144,000 who are following him and take him on, taking him on his journey this is powerful powerful stuff guys okay of course the tribe of ephraim <laughs> it was so funny because jared had shared with me uh that joshua was from the tribe of ephraim and it, it never dawned on me that of course he was right i was like oh great catch because it didn't even dawn on me because when we hear of hosea you don't think of yeshua <laughs> but they're the same person the same person one is the seven of seals from the beginning and the other is during the seven of trumpets <laughs> they're the same <clears throat> and now it totally makes sense that it's joseph from the line messiah ben ephraim because it's a double portion and if it's a double portion then somebody must be the davidic line in the rebuilding of the temple hello <laughs> the clarity is going bananas it's going crazy so now let's take this to the end of seals okay let's go into this into this uh, uh end of seals into trumpets time by going to the end of moses's life and into the time of trumpets at the beginning of trumpets and into trumpets excuse me with um uh, uh, uh joshua so the lord thy god will go over before thee and he will destroy the nations from before thee and thou shalt possess them and joshua he will go over uh he will go over before thee saith the lord so what do we see is happening here it says the lord's going the father's going to go first the Lord thy God, this is the Father. The Lord thy God shall go first and destroy the nations before you. Well, isn't that interesting? Because if this was supposed to be a, a Judah Messiah and his blood and, and the garments being bloodied, then why is it the Father that goes first and destroys them? You see? because it's not that time yet this is the end of seals remember this portion i think i think we got it here in uh we mentioned it a moment ago in daniel chapter 7 here's the exact typology of it here comes the end of seals the first second third fourth beast then the ancient of days did come okay his throne was like a fiery wheel we see the thousands uh thousands of thousands ministered unto him and the thousand times ten thousand stood before him and listen to this this is the end of seals right stood before him the judgment was set and the books were opened how about that but look at what happens i beheld then because the voice uh the voice of the great words which the horn had spake I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and time. Okay? The Antichrist is going to be killed. Who, who's the one that killed him? The Ancient of Days, it's the Father. And that big battle, that Ezekiel 39 war at the end of, uh, in, the, in the end of the six years of seals. It's the Lord. It's the Father. He's going to destroy them. But these guys, these these leaders, these kings, this the the lion and the and the leopard and uh, 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 the bear, they're still going to be alive. Their lives are going to be prolonged. Oh, their armies and their militaries are going to be so devastated. There's it's going to be craziness. But do you remember what it just said? It said the Father will go first and destroy them. This is that. And then Joshua, it said, goes in, right? And then Joshua, who's Joshua? Well, Joshua is Yeshua, and look at what it says. The very next thing after the destruction, 
I saw in the night visions and beheld one like the son of man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before and dominion and kingdom and glory was given. That was the exact same thing from Deuteronomy 31 when we see that the Lord, the Father God is going to go over first, destroy those nations that came against and then possess them and then Joshua comes in and what is Joshua going to do? Joshua is then going to bring them over into the promised land. Be strong, be of good courage, fear not, be not afraid. Listen to this. Okay, we shared this. Bear the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, we shared this in the last one. I don't want to spend too much time on that one because we're coming to the end, right? This is that end portion of seals that we're talking about. Listen to this. Okay, uh, in the land of Ephraim, okay, we find out the city of Palm. We spoke about that in the previous video. Um, and then we see Moses, the servant has died. Okay. Now Moses has died. This is the same typology of John the Baptist. Okay. They, they're going to be all reunited together and John the Baptist is going to be imprisoned and killed. Right. Listen to this. Listen to this. Let me make sure. Oh yeah. I know where I'm at. Okay. And it says, and Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of spirit and wisdom. And there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. This is really interesting, isn't it? Because this is the end of seals. The end of the six years portion of seals. And Moses would die and Joshua is about to take over and he's going to prepare and take them into the promised land. You're going to see an awesome piece of revelation connected here. But what do they say at the end of the sixth seal when he's coming? Hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne. So who is the one that saw him face to face? Moses. Right? Right at that same time. This, this all equals the end of the six years of seals. When they're all screaming, hide us from the face of him, it, Moses, it was Moses who saw him face to face. Okay? Shall show signs and wonders. Let's keep going. Listen to this. Here it comes. This gets really fun now. <coughs> More fun, more exciting. Now, after the death of Moses, we're in Joshua chapter one. So this is the end of the six years of seals, somewhere in that portion of the beginning of the seventh year of seals. Okay. We've talked about this, right? He's he's in this portion. The six years have come to an end and he's in this seventh year, somewhere, not, not in the middle of it, but somewhere near the beginning of this seventh year. And you're going to see why. What have we proven here in this ministry? We know that this whole revelation of 717, we know the escape is that feast of weeks. The rapture is going to happen at Passover. Okay, the rapture is going to happen at Passover in the seventh year of seals. We, we started to reveal and break this down. That old is before new. That old is Leah and goes at the time of the Feast of Weeks, and the new isn't observed until Passover after the fall of the previous year, isn't brought in and observed until Passover. So we know that the rapture, it's the Feasts of the Lord, Feast of Weeks, then Passover, and in third place is Tabernacles. Okay, it's the podium setup. We've talked about it a lot lately. Well, watch this. <coughs> when we get to... When we get to Joshua, we're now in that seventh year period of time. Listen to how Joshua starts. Now, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, uh, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant is dead. Now, therefore, arise. Go over this Jordan, thou and this people into the land which i give to them even to the children of israel you guys remember this hebrews chapter 11 right we know that the first one is relating to enoch in the escape of the bride of christ then you've got the 40 days of noah so you've got the lord coming for the bride you've got the 40 days of noah then beginning the start of tribulation time 
and then by faith right abraham looking to receive the place for his his, his inheritance okay looking for the land of promise what is he looking for when he goes he's looking for the city whose foundation and builder is and maker is god when was the foundation built by zerubbabel during seals and the the temple that will be built in the city that will be rebuilt on that foundation will take place through by zerubbabel but it's not built until they come back into the land this is the rapture time that we've been talking about we've shared it many places right when does this when do they come into the land brothers and sisters when do we show that they come into the land we have proven without a shadow of doubt that the rapture of the great multitude the mid-trib in the seventh year of seals will happen about six months into it because it goes from fall to fall in tribulation that they great multitude rapture will go at passover time Okay, the Passover week is when they are taken. Okay, it's directly related to it. And I'm going to show you even more evidence. This is so much fun. Okay, he tells them to go over the Jordan, right? And all these people into the land, which I will give them and under the children of Israel. Listen to this. This is so fun. Joshua chapter one, verse nine. Have I not commanded thee? Be strong and be of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee wheresoever thou goest. Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people saying, Pass through the host and command the people saying, Prepare you victuals for within three days. Whoops. What the heck? Oh, I hit the hide. For within three days ye shall pass over this Jordan to go in to possess the land which the Lord thy God giveth you to possess it. Joshua brings them into the land. Within three days they shall pass over the Jordan. Have you guys ever seen people in in this piece of scripture and in others? You ever hear them say that when you read it as, and you shall pass over, that there's this relation to Passover, right? It's directly related. That's why in Moses, when they were fleeing, and it said, if you do this, right, with the blood over the door and everything, that the angel of death will pass over you, hence the Passover. This is that same connection. Here we are, and when I showed it to my wife, I was so excited again because it was another, another direct correlation that when they are brought over, this is proof of Joshua, Yeshua, bringing them into the promised land, which we know will happen in the seventh year of seals at Passover. Just like we've been showing. Just like we've been showing. Do you guys realize the pattern in the book of Joshua? Just like we showed the the big overall pattern with Moses' life, we can show this pattern with Joshua's life and being Yeshua. Here he is as the one taking them over. We know that another one is coming to him who's going to be the other branch so that there will be two branches. There will be two olive trees and the two branches who are the two anointed ones. But it's Joshua, Yeshua, that takes them over at Passover first and brings them into the land. We shared that again in the last video, which is when you get to Revelation chapter 7, this is what you see. There's the great multitude. We talked in, in the in the previous video. Oops. We talked about the previous video, uh, um, how they have uh, palms in their hands and they were going to the, the, the city of palm trees, I think it said. <clears throat> I mean, the connections were perfect. But what did we see that we shared in the last video? It was also 717. So we have the video that says uh, 717, right? The name of God starts it and ends it because it was the 40 days that begins and the 40 days when the Lord returns. Okay. 
One is the 40 days, like the days of Noah, that, that relate to him coming as the son of man at the escape of the bride of Christ. And then the second time when it's as Matthew's uh, uh, days of Noah and when Satan would be there to tempt him for 40 days. And that was the beginning of the final year. <coughs> and then it turned out we had another 717, which is related to the second position, right? So what we had shared was how the first position and the last position each started with a 40 days escape in 40 days and the Lord's return in 40 days. And then in this 717, there wasn't a connection for this one until we in the last video realized that 717 at the time of the rapture is Revelation 717, just like Genesis 717 was the beginning and the end. So it was pretty cool. So we, we see these connections. This is the time frame. We know it's connected to Passover. All three groups have a direct connection within Scripture that relate to 717. And here we are, no different, more proof that it's related to the time of Passover. We saw the one in Hebrews. Well, this is what I was saying. When you understand the book of Joshua and, and his overall story, it's about him bringing them into the land, okay? Crossing over and bringing them into the land, this seventh year of seals, and then the time of the beginning of trumpets begins. Well, when you get to about the middle of Joshua's book, okay? Let's go to Joshua. When you get to the middle of Joshua, see, 24 chapters. When you get to chapter 12 and chapter 13, what, what, what do you think the typology of this time frame would be do you think maybe the middle time frame the, the the time of joshua's time which is what trumpets right so if he's bringing them into the land at the end of seals and trumpets begins wouldn't it make sense that by about mid trumpets is the time when the pit would open wouldn't that make sense that mid trumpets is about the time when the pit would open. Well, do you know that's exactly what happens? See, trumpets, what happens at the fifth trumpet? <coughs> okay, at that four and then the fifth trumpet. What do we know happens? The fifth trumpet is the beginning of three, is the first three and a half years have come to an end, right? The first three and a half years have come to an end, correct? We've shared this many times. The rebuilding of the city and the streets and the temple and the 144,000 gone out during the first three and a half years while the rebuilding and everything takes place. What happens? The pit is open. The pit is open. It's the time of the fifth trumpet. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. How long does this war last? We've shared that this war lasts for two and a half years. This is the Daniel chapter 9. <coughs> Remember this in Daniel chapter 9? Daniel chapter 9, we've shared on this so many times. Right, the 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 first seven weeks they're removed from the land, okay. Then the first three and a half years they're rebuilding the city and the streets and the wall, and after three and a half years Messiah shall be cut off again, but not for himself. And the people of the prince shall come, and they shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood. This is the flood from Revelation twelve, that he goes after them. Satan goes after them with a flood out of his mouth, and then the. The Lord, the, the land opens and swallows the water that they can flee. They're going to be removed from the land, those that will be saved, till the end of the 14 years, for the final three and a half years. But this war, when the pit is opened at mid-trumpets, and Satan here with all his minions, lasts for two and a half years. And this is the final year when the Lord returns as king and will destroy, as we said, when Satan had had power for two and a half years right here. So what do we see? <coughs> this cutting off, 
brothers and sisters, isn't his death immediately. I told you I was going to connect this way deeper. This is when he's cut off. Remember, this Messiah is what? This Messiah is Joshua, Yeshua, but he's also, there is also another one. There's Zerubbabel there. He's the other branch, right? During the rebuilding. And what happens? We know that when the pit opens, there's going to be a war. And there's going to be an end to this war. This war lasts for two and a half years. When we come to Revelation chapter 11, the pit has opened. All right? The pit has opened. And he's going to make war against who? He's going to make war against who? The two witnesses? These are what? The two olive trees? Hello. Who are the two olive trees? What did we just read about the two olive trees in Zechariah? One is the king. One is, is the one with the rebuilding in the temple. And the other one, the other branch, is Joshua, Yeshua, the high priest. The king and the priest are the ones that are anointed. They are the two witnesses. They are the two witnesses, it would appear. Because it's the two anointed ones. The two anointed ones, the only ones that could be anointed are kings and priests. So when the pit is opened, they're going to make war against them for two and a half years. What happens, brothers and sisters, when you get to Joshua chapter 12, about midway through Joshua's book, which would be about mid-trumpets? And the coast of Og, king of Bashan, which was from the remnant of the giants. How about Joshua 13? The king of Og of Bashan and Edra, who remained of the remnant of the giants. Brothers and sisters, do you follow? When the pit is opened. When the pit is open, when the fifth trumpet, this doesn't mean trumpet one, trumpet two, it just means the seven years of trumpets. The fifth trumpet opens. When the pit is open, when Satan has lost his battle in heaven and is cast down, when we go to Revelation 12 and we read about it, we see that after the 1260 days, Michael destroys him. Okay, he's cast down. Woe to the world. We know he's going to open the pit. And when he opens the pit, it's the first woe, right? The fifth, sixth, and seventh trumpet are the three woes. It's the first woe, and he's going to go after to persecute the woman, okay? But she's going to fly away to the place protected on the wings of an eagle, and she's going to remain there. So those who were saved during the time of the first three and a half years by Messiah and with the 144,000, they're going to be taken to a place of refuge, to a place protected until the end of the 14 years, right through the two and a half years of Satan, even the final year of the ark story from Matthew. You see, and the serpent cast out a flood after them. And then what he went to do? He went to make war with the remnant. Okay, so this war, is it going to happen with the 144,000 as well? Yes. He's going after the 144,000. So, so those, those, minions of his that come out of the pit and everything they're going to go after the 144 and he's going to go after the two witnesses the two witnesses there's going to be this battle that's going to last for two years and Zechariah told us that the two witnesses the king and priest that's zerubbabel and joshua yeshua and how long is this battle going to last? We've proven it over and over and over again in Daniel and in other places that it's going to last two and a half years. That's why going back to Daniel, oh man, this is so gangbusters. This is why going back to Daniel, as we've shared this many times, he says, how long shall this be? Right? 
and he tells him that it shall be for a time, times, and a half. Till he have scattered the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. This is two and a half years. There's no end here. There's no addition. So it's one, two, and a half, two and a half years. But they were taken away into the wilderness for three and a half years, which means even the final year when the Lord returns as the Lion of Judah, and it's going to be this crushing devastation, they will still be in the place protected until that final time is over. What's happening during these two and a half years? The rebuilding has been complete. The pit's going to open. When the pit opens, they're going to come and bring destruction there. And the battle is going to begin against what? The giants as it was in the days of Noah, right? There's these giants that are still in the land because the pit is open. And you have the exact same typology in the middle of the book of Joshua when they have to go and there's this battle against the giants. It's the exact time frame of the two and a half years to the end of the war. What happens at the two and a half years at the end of the war? The two olive trees, the two witnesses, they're killed. You see, what a lot of people don't realize is that when the bottomless pit is opened and they shall make war against them and shall overcome and kill them, they don't realize what this timing is. We've been sharing it here for years that this timing is the revelation of two and a half years, which is why Daniel then says, you know, to the end of the war, and then there's one more week, one more year. It's why Revel uh, Daniel 12, I just showed you, said time, times, and a half a time. That's two and a half. Yet there's still three and a half years to go. And that's because that final one of Daniel 9, 27 is that final year when the Lord returns as the Lion of Judah. But do you see, I was talking about this with our brother Mark oh, a couple weeks ago now. And I mentioned it in passing in the last video. That I, I was on to something here. And some have speculated about this in the past. We're now showing you. We're now showing you. One of them is Yeshua and the other one is going to be Zerubbabel. They're the two witnesses that will be killed by the end of the two and a half years. I don't believe the 144,000 can die. But we know Messiah will die again. We know it. We've proven it. We got the video called again and we've broken it down from every single piece and part. But this is where it gets even crazier. How many times, brothers and sisters, have I shown you? Let me give you an example of this. Watch this. Okay. Uh, let me show you an example in Mark. We've shown you that the transfiguration story of Mark that says after six days is a typology of Christ coming at the end of six years of seals, just like we showed, right? Just like at the end of the sixth seal, at the end of six years is a typology of the six days is six years in the end of days. When you go to Matthew and you go to Matthew chapter 17, and it's the same thing after six days, this isn't the same six days. This is the six days as a typology of six years when he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives as, as the Judah one. Okay? What else have we done? We can show you in Genesis chapter 8, this story that is the beginning. See the 40 days of the Son of Man that relates to when he comes at the escape. The escape happens and then 40 days of the Son of Man. When the 40 days are over, you have the raven and then the dove, which we call Acts 2.0. So the 50 days have come to an end. And then what's going to happen? Wait 70 days, which means what? In the end times, it's a typology of seven years. It's the seven years of seals. And what happens in the seventh year of seals? When the dove returns, he plucks out of the mouth. That's the rapture. And then what? He waits seven more days, which in the end time revelation is seven more years. And when it's all over, it's the 601st year, which means it's the 6,000th and first year when the 14 is over, seven days as years and seven days as years. 
So what do you have? Days as years, days as years, days as years. We have shown these things many, 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 many times. Well, I'm gonna show you something else fascinating. In Christ's death and resurrection, Man, this is jam-packed. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Spirit. Thank you for bringing clarity to all of this and settling my mind. Thank you. We have shared this many times, right? This revelation and this understanding, when you know who the Gospels are speaking to, you understand that it is impossible that Messiah, at his death was in the grave for three days and three nights. People have tried to justify it in so many different ways to say that even though he was in the grave for two and a half, uh, sorry, for a day and a half, they'll even tell you, we showed a video a while back, that even though it was a day and a half in the grave, They'll try and explain away that it was like six hours of one day, 24 hours of one, and then six hours of the next. So any part of one day to the Jew is three days. That does not explain three days and three nights. It hasn't happened yet. It's impossible. Because a part of one day and a part of another isn't three days and three nights you follow you can't it's impossible to do with a day and a half and this is why we've shown it's because of the confusion of reading from the foundation of matthew we have proven this is what was when he came the first time the angel explains to him right here in luke 24 at the resurrection It says, saying the son of man, he told you, remember? Start in verse six. He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was uh, was yet in Galilee? Saying the son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men. That was the beginning of the count. We have this talked about in the video, I think, comma and. The importance of the comma and, just like we shared in the two and a half years compared to the three and a half. This means the count of the three days for the Lord rising again on the third day. The count began when he was taken to the hands of sinful men. Comma and be crucified. Comma and the third day rise again. Hence, on the 14th day, Okay, at midnight or in in the evening, he had the Passover. Then they went out to pray. And when they went out to pray, then Judas came and he was taken into the hands of sinful men. That began the count. Okay, in the in the evening portion of the 14th, the beginning of the 14th from an evening to evening. Right. So then he was taken to the hands of sinful men. He was was ridiculed, spit on, beaten. He was put into prison. And in the morning portion of the 14th, he was brought before the the Pilate and and Herod and so forth. And then what? Then he was crucified before sunset on the 14th and put in the grave before sunset on the 14th. Because the 15th was the Sabbath and it was a high Sabbath, right? because it was the beginning of Passover week of unleavened bread. So on that day, nobody went to see or anything because it was the Sabbath. So he was fully in the grave for the entire 15th day of Nisan. And the third day was the early in the morning. Okay, that's the early in the morning on the first day of the week. What's the first day of the week? the next day after the Sabbath. So if the 15th is the Sabbath, which it is, then it was early in the morning on the 16th, which means he was also overnight from an evening to day, from an evening to evening in how they count their days, which means all of the 15th through the evening of the 16th and early in the morning 
on the 16th day of the month. That would be the third day early in the morning. Remember, I just explained to you days as years in the end days revelation. Remember that? I just shared with you how there's a revelation of what has happened being a revelation of what did happen in, a, in days. We have a typology in the end being years. But there are things that didn't happen that will still play out as days. This already happened in days. And it was about two and a half days. Do you guys remember this revelation? <coughs> Remember the Gospel of John? Okay, John is the typology of the 21 full complete years in the big picture. From 8 to 21 is the 7 and 7 of seals and trumpets. When does Messiah get taken into the hands of sinful men in John? John's chapters are chapters to years. So what we're looking at now is days represented as years. And what happens? In John chapter 18, bam, taken into the hands of sinful men. What happens in chapter 19? Bam, crucifixion, crucifixion. What happens in 20? Part way down into 20, what do you get? His resurrection again. John's book is chapters to years. The events that took place already were days. Days being represented in the end as years. Messiah's being cut off is one of the two witnesses, Zerubbabel being the other. The war, when the pit opens, lasts for two and a half years. With its lasting two and a half years, <coughs> and Messiah being one of the two witnesses, then being killed, isn't killed until when? The end of the sixth seal. If he's being, sorry, the end of the sixth trumpet. If he's being killed at the end of the sixth trumpet, it means being taken to the hands of sinful men, right? But in this case, we know it's a battle, just like Joshua. It's a battle against those with the pit. It's the war that lasts two and a half years. It's the typology of taking to the hands of sinful men, being crucified, and then resurrected. What happens in the end of the sixth year of trumpets as the typology of two and a half years as two and a half days in the end? from the time of the pit being opened and the war breaking out for three for two and a half years. When the two and a half years are over and the sixth trumpet is over, brothers and sisters, what happens? The two witnesses are killed. What do we have in the end of days, in any piece of end of day scripture that is after three days, and three nights. The two witnesses and their dead bodies lie on the street for three and a half days. What would be after three days and three nights? After three days and after three nights, in the grave would mean at some point on the fourth day. Do you know why we're talking about this? <clears throat> 
because we've been told in Matthew, we've been told in Matthew chapter 12, the story of Jonah. We know the story of Jonah did not happen yet in Matthew, nor in Mark, nor in Luke. We know that it was prophetic that in Luke, he told us he would be as Jonah was. He would be the warning for 40 days. This is what the Son of Man is doing. This is what we're talking about at the beginning when the bride is gone and then it's the 40 days of the Son of Man. In, in Mark's story of Jonah, <clears throat> they're given no warning. Jesus said, you get nothing. And he gets on the ship and he leaves. This is why they don't know that they have to wait for about six months before the rapture time. They have no warning. They're going to see him coming at the end of the six years of seals. At the end of the six seal, at the end of the six year, they're going to see him coming, but they don't yet know when they go. <coughs> and what is it told? What are we told in Matthew? In Matthew, we are told 12 verse 40. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. It was impossible that Christ in the first coming was three days and three nights in the heart of the earth because the entire story wasn't even a full three days and three nights. We know it was only a day and a half, which means this was prophecy just as Luke's was, just as Mark's was, which means he still has to fulfill a period of time that will be three days and three nights before he can come out from the heart of the earth. Do you follow what I'm saying? Do you understand that to be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, it has not happened yet? And the only way for it to happen in the end of days is if he is one of the two witnesses. It is the only piece of scripture in end days and end times revelation that has to do with something after three days and after three nights. Do you know Matthew's resurrection story? Listen to what it says. Uh, Matthew's crucifixion story, starting in verse uh, 63, saying, Sir, we remember that the deceiver, okay, speaking of Jesus, said, while he was yet alive, after three days, I will rise again. Command, therefore, that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say unto the people, he is risen from the dead. Listen to this. I love this. I remember when I first saw this, my jaw hit the floor. They say, so the last error shall be worse than the first. What? This is only found in Matthew. So that the last error shall be worse than the first. The first was his first time. The last is his second time. What happens in Revelation 11 <coughs> as we wind it down? What happens in Revelation 11 after the three and a half days? They rise to their feet. Everybody freaks out. They, boom, take off to heaven. All right? Listen to what it says. After three and a half days, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying, unto them come up hither and they ascended up to heaven in a cloud and their enemies beheld them and the same hour there was a great earthquake see same hour means it's the end of the sixth trumpet and the same hour there was a great earthquake and a tenth part of the city fell in the quake uh 
in the quake were slain the men of men seven thousand and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the god of heaven the second woe is past the end of the sixth trumpet and now the seventh trumpet is about to sound and what do we read from revelation 10 <laughs> here it comes starting in verse 3 and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth and when he hath cried seven thunders uttered their voices uh and when the seven thunders had uttered their voices i was about to write and i heard a voice from heaven saying unto me seal up those things which the seven voices had uttered and write them not so who's the voice now proclaiming this the one that's roar is as a lion verse six and swear by him that liveth forever who created heaven and the things that are therein and the earth and the things that therein are and the sea and the things that are therein that there should be time no longer but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel when he shall begin to sound the seventh trumpet the mystery of god should be finished what was this finished brothers and sisters daniel chapter 12 when he shall have completed to scatter the power of all the people when it'll all be finished after two and a half years it shall be finished and the seventh trumpet shall sound and when it does the mystery of god will be over and who comes at this point at the seventh trumpet sounded and there were great voices in heaven saying the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our lord and of his christ and he shall reign forever and ever the lord now returns feet down on the mount of olives just like zechariah chapter 14 said the lord will now come and this will be as when he fought in the day of battle what's going to happen at this point this is the final year when he returns as the lion and as the lion of the tribe of judah and his garments will be covered in the in the blood of grapes again what is this revelation chapter 14 as well when we go to the end of chapter 14 it's exactly what we read verse 14 actually starting in verse 18 but in verse 19 and the angel of the lord thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of god and the winepress was trodden down without the city and blood came out of the winepress even unto the horses bridles the space of a thousand six hundred furlongs brothers and sisters have you absorbed everything that i just shared with you here it ends with joshua saying and now the lord god hath given rest unto your brethren as he had promised see they had destroyed them the battle had taken place <clears throat> and now he's returning and what's happening check it out i'll end it with this in joshua chapter 22 the eastern tribes return home it's about the tribes returning into the land and in the end in the 14th year joshua renews the covenant what is this renewal of the covenant i don't have it highlighted here what is this renewal of the covenant brothers and sisters but the very same thing we shared for years in daniel chapter 9 when the lord returns having made this covenant at the beginning of trumpets with zerubbabel 
then being cut off because of this war, that he had to break his covenant that Zechariah 11 shares with us. When he returns in that final year, he will renew the covenant that he made with the nations that he had to break because Satan and the pit was opened and Satan was come. And for all the abominations that they had done, it's going to be made desolate even unto the consummation and det- that is determined and shall be poured out upon the desolate. This is the renewal of that at the end in that final year, just like the story of Joshua. What? <laughs> what? This is awesome. This is so awesome. And I had no idea after dinner tonight, as I was coming back, I was still stressed. I was still, uh, and I sat down after dinner, which made this a late one. And I sat down after dinner and I said, no, I got to get one done tonight. I've got to piece this together. Whoa. Mind blowing. I could feel the short circuit. I think I could smell it (laughs) taking place in my mind. Brothers and sisters. Please take the time. Please watch this again. This is for the Bereans here in Ministry Revealed who are seeking and searching the details of the revelation of the end of days. This is that. Wow. I love you guys. God bless you. God bless your families. Time is short. Pray for each other. Strengthen each other. Lift each other up. And we will see you all very soon, for the time is near at hand. I love you guys. God bless you. Bye for now.